Journalist Andy MacDonald, Labour MP for Middlesbrough. Uh, Ed Vasey, Lord Vasey, Conservative peer and former culture minister. And Mo Hussein, political commentator and former special advisor to Amber Rudd when she was Home Secretary. The number to call if you'd like to put your questions to our panel, 0345 6060 973. And don't forget, you can watch Global Player. And thanks for all the lovely messages that are coming through about Alexei Goncharenko. I'll pass them on to him, I promise. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. From Global's newsroom at 8 o'clock, the Prime Minister says the UK doesn't want to scrap the Northern Ireland Protocol, but believes it can be fixed. He's had talks in Belfast with the five main parties at Stormont to try to break the deadlock over the issue. Mr Johnson says legislation to rip up parts of the post-Brexit trading arrangements is insurance in case a deal can't be reached with Brussels. A 22-year-old man's been found guilty of beating police community support officer Julia James to death in Kent last year. Detective Superintendent Gavin Moss spoke outside Canterbury Crown Court. Callum Wheeler is an incredibly dangerous individual in my mind. Uh, he has brought absolutely mi absolute misery to a great many people, um, Noticeably, the, the community uh, from where Julia James lived, most importantly, her family and friends. President Putin says he has no problem with Sweden or Finland, but will respond to their joining NATO. Sweden has followed its neighbour in confirming it will apply for membership of the Defence Alliance following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Manchester United, Chelsea and Tottenham are among the clubs sending messages of support to Blackpool footballer Jake Daniels. The 17-year-old forward has become the UK's first active male professional player to come out as gay. In the city, the FTSE 100 closed up 46 points at 74.64. The pound buys $1.22 and €1.17. LBC weather, clear spells for many areas overnight. Tomorrow, dry and very warm in sunny spells for central and eastern parts. Rain in the west, a high of 24 degrees. From Global's Newsroom for LBC, I'm Andy Ivey. This is LBC from Global. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Hello, very good evening. It's coming up to three minutes past eight on LBC. Welcome to Monday's edition of Cross Question. Joining me in the studio on the panel, we have Afia Hagen, who is a broadcaster and journalist, uh, Andy MacDonald, Labour MP for Middlesbrough, uh, Ed Vasey, Lord Vasey, Conservative peer and former culture minister, and Mo Hussein, political commentator and former special advisor to Amber Rudd when she was Home Secretary. Uh, lots for you to ask our panel about tonight. 0345 6060 973 is the number to call and of course you can watch what we do on Global Player. Call 0345 60 60 973 Tweet at LBC Text 84850 Cross Question with Ian Dale This is LBC Well welcome to you all Let's go to our first caller It's Martin in Doncaster Martin, hello, what would you like to ask? Hi Ian and panel, I'd like to ask is it a stain on the Conservative Party that in 2022 more people are in Blackpool are dying than being born? What, what do you put that down to? Ten years of, cut, cut, ten years of cutbacks and everything. Um, I know in 2018, under Theresa May, life expectancy was going down. And I think with the council cuts over the last ten years and benefit cuts and drug clinics and sure star centres and everything uh, and no investment hardly up in the north uh, and uh, um, I, I, I think it's some of it has to, has, has to, has to do with this OK um, Andy MacDonald Well I mean I think it is a stain uh, on the record of this government because we sadly live in a very unequal uh, country and that uh, inequality has grown over recent times. And when I was a practicing lawyer, we used to rely upon life expectancies increasing over time. We thought we were on a, an upward trajectory that was going to continue. Uh, and that, for the first time, I think, in living memory, that has started to uh, uh, go the opposite direction. So, I mean, as a, as a measure of economic and social success, I mean, it, it tells its own story. And, and Blackpool is not dissimilar to, to my own 
constituency in terms of demographic, the same health profiles, economic experiences uh, will be replicated in my uh, town as they are in, in Blackpool. And people are having a tough time and it's getting a tougher by the month. And we see that as we go through this cost of living crisis, that has a real outcome in terms of people's health, their mental health, uh, and their sustainability. And that, it, surely, that's a, the role of any government is to give people a good and flourishing life rather than one that's under so much stress and strain where we have these sorts of outcomes. This is not a good record in terms of health outcomes or life expectancy. It is it is indeed a stain on My, the government of the day. I think we need to understand the reasons as to why this is happening. There is definitely an issue across the country. There is a difference in life expectancy. Uh, there are health inequalities. I think the government has identified that. Uh, it is part of the levelling up agenda. Clearly, we need to see progress on this. We need to see action rather than just rhetoric. Uh, but we need to understand rather than just blaming a government for this, looking at why it's happening, how historic it is, and what needs to be done going forward to make sure that these inequalities are uh, diminishing, not growing. Because there have always been um, life expectancy inequalities throughout the United Kingdom. I remember um, not that long ago, Glasgow had a life expectancy for adult males of under 60, which you think, well, how can that be that one city in the United Kingdom can be so different from most others? Yeah, exactly. And I think that is replicated and there will be different issues across the country that do need to be looked at quite forensically and acted upon. And I think the, the problem for the government, the challenge is that it has spoken about this a lot. We've heard a lot about this agenda, but actually, A, it takes time to uh, deal with it. But B, you need to see the action, you need to see the measures, which will be different across different parts of the country to really tackle this and really equalise it again. Afia Hagen. I think Mo is right, right? It's definitely going to take time for levelling up to a car. But the caller is actually right as well, that we have had 10 or 12 years of Tory cuts, of cutting sure start centres, of um, cutting benefits. We're now in the biggest cost of living crisis that we've had for many, many years. And that's only actually going to make things worse. The socioeconomic issues that you have in terms like Blackpool, you mentioned Glasgow, you know, I grew up in Paisley just outside Glasgow. You know, yes, it had for a long time, male life expectancy was under 60. Let's not forget also that Glasgow is right next to Paisley, which used to be the stab capital of Europe, that massively affected life expectancy as well until uh, knife crime was treated as a public health problem. You have all these different socioeconomic issues in towns across the United Kingdom. Now we're in a situation where we are coming off the back of 10 or 12 years of Tory austerity, which is only actually getting worse. And it's going to get worse. It's only going to get worse. We're in this cost of living crisis that we don't really seem to have a way out of. And so people are going to be affected by if they can eat, if they can heat their homes. Life expectancy, we can expect it to go down. So it's massively a stain on the Tory government. But it's also a stain on the people that keep voting for the Tory government. And and that's why this country is in the situation it is in the first place. But presumably this, this is a situation where you've got life expectancy coming down mm -hmm. and the birth rate coming down as well. Because if you are stuck in a sort of vortex of poverty, mm -hmm. inevitably people are going to have fewer children because they yeah. can't afford to have them. Absolutely. They can't afford to feed themselves and the children they have. They're not going to have more children. Uh, and that's going to have a real effect on towns and cities as well. If you don't have new generations coming through and also people that can afford to move out of the area will move out of the area if there's deprivation, you know, taking their families and those opportunities somewhere else. So, yeah, that's going to be a huge problem as well. But it's going to take a long time to claw it back. You know, 10 or 12 years of a Tory government, it's going to take another generation before perhaps life expectancy goes up again, before people move to those areas and start having children and, and start building up the areas again. So we're a generation or two from reversing where we are now. Ed Vasey, lift us from our state of depression. <laughs> well, it is a terrible statistic to hear. It's like a punch of the solar plexus when your caller puts it in uh, those terms. And it is, I think, incumbent on politicians to pause and reflect on why that should be the case and not simply to brush it away or excuse it. But having said that, it is the first time I've heard the statistic and there will be some element of context to that. It'll be to do with uh, the local area, but it will also be related to COVID. Don't forget that life expectancy has fallen in other mm -hmm. 
countries as well. COVID has, you know, I'm not a statistician, but by definition has reduced life expectancy because a lot of people in Western countries, not just the UK, have died of COVID. So that may be uh, one of the factors. And then I think to echo Mo, because clearly the question and the, it is directed at the government and, and what is the government going to do about this, you could actually say in the government's defence that this government under Boris Johnson has recognised that as an issue. That is why we have a Secretary of State for levelling up. That's why they've made levelling up the mantra, because they recognise the difference between, to put it crudely, the affluent South and the North, which uh, has uh, had historically less investment and let fewer economic uh, opportunities. And there is clearly a conscious effort by the government to change that. But again, as Mo said, rhetoric is one thing and real action and making a real difference is another. And then if you take a further step back, of course, there is the reflection of what politicians and what politics can do about this. We've had a row today, for example, about Boris Johnson reversing the junk food advertising ban. And I think and have thought since I've been sort of practising politics that the way that government is organised and function functions is completely wrong and completely out of date and that we need a much more holistic approach if you're dealing with crime you're dealing actually with a health issue you know if you you shouldn't be i think what jeremy hunt has done this week to highlight avoidable deaths in the nhs is another huge issue we need much more joined up government focused on the quality of life which includes job opportunities you know when you slam 10 or 12 years of tory austerity of course one forgets the statistics that the cameron government was proud of the greatest job creation uh, in sort of 20 or 30 years in the UK and jobs and having a job makes a huge difference to people's well-being and life expectancy. So it's an extremely complex issue, but people should reflect on it. Uh, and weirdly, the Tory gov this Tory government is focused precisely on that issue. But what is it? I mean, this is relating more to the cost of living crisis than Martin's question, possibly. But what is it about government ministers who go on programmes and come out with crass statements like Rachel McLean did today, say, well, the way out of it is to work harder or get a better job. Uh, and you have sort of George Eustace saying, yeah, well, you get yellow label food at supermarket. And you think, well, OK. I mean, there's a certain amount of logic to what they say, but the, the, the sense of being so out of touch... Yeah, it is, with a, the it general is, it is a tin here. First of all, I mean, it's an iron law of politics, and maybe Andy will agree with me on this, that you certainly shouldn't tell people how to live their lives down to the minutiae of, you know, uh, whether it's taking more exercise, which I'm always told to do, or what you buy... Um, in the supermarket, people take great, great offence to that, particularly from politicians who, generally speaking, are better off than the uh, rest of the uh, rest of the pu public. But the, the thing about the cost of living crisis, again, without wishing to say that the UK government uh, is let off the hook, is a Western crisis at the moment. Again, as as a result of COVID, there is a massive cost of living crisis across all uh, Western countries. But the government must lean into that and recognise that people are really hurting. You know, trying to pay your heating bills or fill your car, you certainly don't want to be lectured, dare I say it, by an environmentalist saying that's a great thing that you can't fill up your van and go to work, you know, mm. get on a bicycle, because that's not how most people live their lives. Andy? Yeah, just on the point about, you know, go and get a better job, work longer hours, I think it's one of the most tone-deaf things I've heard in a long time. Because you know, what happens to the person who's able to get a better job? Who's going to fill that job? Are they not entitled to a decent a living standard, to lead a flourishing life, so that when they go to work, they have enough money to live on? Um, we've we've applauded people and we've recognised them through the COVID crisis as doing vital work. You know, people who clean our buildings, keeping us free from disease. Are we saying, you know, if you're not uh, doing doing well enough, leave that job, go and get something else? I think it's wholly disrespectful. Surely, to goodness, we should uh, uh, treat people with dignity and say that's something that we so value. Thank you for doing it. You need to be paid a proper rate of pay so you can have a good life. Mm -hmm. uh, and this whole business about job creation, you know, we've got to create good, well-paid, secure jobs. Uh, it isn't good enough to simply create low-paid, fragile works, yeah. work that doesn't Just help. on levelling up, I mean, it, let's take the party politics out of this. In your area, which, I mean, the government of, has particularly targeted the North East, or at least they say they, they, say they have. have. Have you seen evidence of levelling up in your region that you could actually point to and say, well, this is a good thing that they've done? 
No, I can't. I can't, I can't see a, a, a single thing. And of course, when we look at the comparison opposite the monies that we would have received from the European uh, structural funds and elsewhere, we're at a lower level than we would have been in the EU. We see all manner of opportunities for capital, obviously for people to come and invest and hopefully jobs to be created. But there is no discussion about what the benefits are for working people. It's simply the trickle-down economics theory uh, that we know doesn't work. And the word trickle's a good one, isn't it? It's not a cascading of wealth and shrinking of inequality. It's you can have these crumbs and these little bits. So there's no voice for people to have ownership about their own future uh, and that truly is leveling up people are being in the, in that position and i see no evidence of that whatsoever i just see opportunities being given uh, for privatization and other other interests to come and uh, develop and, and secure their own interests but not for the community and any of this investment that comes into into a territory like mine it will only be uh, worth having if it produces the outcomes that we've talked about in the first place you know improved health outcomes life expectancy uh, good mental health people having uh, uh, good uh, healthy well-being uh, measures that reflect a good life that isn't part of it okay uh, sherlock on twitter says why are the panel throwing stones at an mp who encouraged people to better themselves rather than relying on government handouts well there you go there's always one it's 16 <laughs> minutes past eight this is lbc Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Text 84850. 18 minutes past eight on LBC. It's cross question with me are Afia Hagen, broadcaster and journalist Andy McDonald, Labour MP for Middlesbrough, Ed Vasey, Conservative peer and former culture minister, and Mo Hussein, political commentator, former special advisor to Amber Rudd. Uh, right, an allied question to what we've just been talking about in a way. June in Kettering says Government Minister Rachel McLean this morning suggested those struggling with the cost of living should get another, jo another job or work more hours. I work 60 hours a week. I've tried to find an other job but can't just how out of touch are this government what more can the government actually do could the cost of living crisis lose them the next election mo hussein Potentially, yes, I think it could. I think this is the biggest political issue uh, and real life issue facing the country now. And having worked in government comms for many years, I suspect many of my former colleagues were tearing their hair out because I don't think ministers should be micromanaging and telling people how to live their lives in that way. It never, ever ends well. I was in Downing Street when um, there was a lobby briefing with political journalists on uh, energy bills and somebody said, we're another jumper in a slightly flippant way and that was not how it was uh, presented and how it was received and it shouldn't have happened. So um, it does lay the government open to the charge that they are out of touch and I think what people want to hear is what the government is doing for them to help and there have been some measures. Uh, I think more needs to happen and we need to hear about that and quite quickly because this is the thing, you know, party gate, various other things to one side. I think this is the thing in terms of the impact on people's 
budgets and impact on their lives, this is the thing that will come back to haunt the government if they don't act decisively on it. Avia? I think this will cost them the next election because I think people have gone to the point now where enough is enough and the cost of living crisis off the back of COVID is really pushing a lot of people to the edge. Um, I think, you know, if you've got someone like June who's working 60 hours a week, which is a heck of a lot, also trying to find another job but can't, you know, there's people like that up and down the country. I also think our ministers are continually out of touch with what everyday people are going through, um, whether that's um, working 60 hours a week, trying to feed their families, you're telling people to work longer hours or get another job. What about childcare? What about people with young children? And childcare is so expensive. I mean, honestly, you know, when I first went back to work when my daughter was young, it wasn't worth me working. The nursery fees were the exact amount of money that I earned a month. So what was the point in that? You know, childcare is so ridiculous. Get a better job. <laughs> oh, I knew you were going to say that. Thanks very much. <laughs> um, but this is the thing, is that government, is, government ministers are not taking this into account. You know, that people have things like childcare or might, might want to have a quality of life where they don't work 100 hours a week, you know? And I think unless we can get government ministers who actually sound like they care about their constituents, who are in touch with what everyday people are going through day to day, day to day scraping money together to buy food, living paycheck to paycheck as so many people do. And first of all, they shouldn't be doing the media rounds. That's that's the first thing. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, they just shouldn't, should they? And second of all, they should... I've had this conversation <laughs> a few times with various people who should remain nameless they over the last just, few weeks. Just be quiet. <laughs> nobody, nobody asked you, well, somebody it is actually, and they, you shouldn't have been asked. Just be quiet. So what you're saying is come back at Vasey. Always, Please. Always, no, well, always who knows, who who knows what terrible gap I'm going to make in the next <laughs> 10 minutes. But I mean, I, you know, you will have the last laugh when it's announced next week that you've got Ian Dale's job. You know, then, <laughs> then you'll be able to come on this show wearing a T-shirt saying, I've got a better job. Actually, no, you've got a much better job. You're free like you do it. Uh, look, I think I, I, I don't want to sound too much like Mo's mini me, but I do agree with everything he just said, which is, yes, the cost of living crisis could cost us the next election. It is immaterial that it's a cost of living crisis that's affecting many other countries just as uh, arguably the economic crisis of 0708 cost Labour the last election, even though, ironically, it was possibly Gordon Brown's finest hour in getting the world to react together. But the voters subliminally, first of all, it's an economic crisis. No government in power benefits from that, if that doesn't sound too uh, tinier like a Tory <laughs> MP. Uh, and secondly, the voters sort of also say, well, you should have seen this coming and done something about it. But clearly the government, therefore has to be seen to has to act and has to do things that make a material difference to people's uh, lives in the next two years because there's a crisis. I mean, the governor of the Bank of England, I think, gave evidence, I think it may have been to a parliamentary committee today, saying, you know, food prices, he, he kind of said they were apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. I didn't think that was a particularly helpful word to use, by the way. Uh, but, you know, I think we're in the foothills of what this could look like in the autumn, and mm. it's pretty scary. And government needs to understand that they need to at least show the public they do know what is potentially coming down the track andy mcdonald i think it is biting because uh, when i you know it was out the weekend and we were talking about the cost of living crisis and about energy bills and 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 people are responding uh, and and it it's not just that it's the issue of trust as well which is it being eroded um and people making all sorts of complaints but the cost of living crisis is really taking hold now because people have seen it once uh, in April with the, the bills rising and now they're going to expect more and when they hear that Shell and BP and the like have made very significant mm. excess profits over and above whilst the, the price of energy has risen and there's reluctance to accept a, a windfall tax which seems I mean you know Ch Chancellor Lawson did that back in the day um, so why that isn't being seized upon as, as some temporary relief in the short term people are getting frustrated by that and I think rightly so uh, but I, I think the answer to the question I think this is where the next election will turn on the cost of living issue and I think it's not looking good for the Tories. Because if you, if you remember back to the, the American election in 1980, do you remember that debate? 
Andy, you'll remember this. You're all you are getting so nerdy. No, 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 there is a relevance to this, yeah. I promise you. Just Sorry. bear with me a minute, Ed. <laughs> when um, Reagan was debating Carter, and he looked straight into the oh, camera yeah. and said, are you better off now than you were four years ago and of course there aren't many people who are going to be able to answer yes in 2024 yeah. i don't think anyway so it's, it's it's quite a difficult place to win an election from when, when you're in that situation uh 0345 6060973 is the number to call if you'd like to ask our panel a question you can text 84850 uh, sean is in concert hello sean hello how are you doing lads all right we're uh, all right thank you this is a very serious question right um has Johnson and the DUP lost the plot? And this could be in danger of losing the Good Friday Agreement. Mm. So this is all over the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, as you know, we're going to be in Belfast for the show tomorrow. We actually booked this date two months ago. <laughs> it proves to be rather rather a good day to be there. Um, Ed Vasey, um, the, Boris Johnson has been in Northern Ireland today trying to persuade the DUP to um, uh, allow a new executive to be formed. Don't think he made much headway there. Um, and, and let's widen it out into the Northern Ireland Protocol because the DUP, um, they are wholly against it and so are the unionists, but all the other parties are fully in favour of it. This is one of those intractable issues for Northern Ireland, isn't it? Well, it is an intractable issue and I suspect the protocol is one big problem and I suspect also what lies behind it uh, is the DUP not wanting to go into power with Sinn Féin and seeing for the first time ever a Sinn Féin First Minister. I mean, that's an existential moment for the unionist cause in uh, Northern Ireland. So I suspect that it's, uh, I hesitate to say convenient excuse, but it just happens to coincide with, with a moment when they certainly don't want to see that happen. I mean, we all knew what was coming down the line with Brexit and people were warned and we debated endlessly in Parliament that there had to be a border somewhere. It had to either be between Northern Ireland and Ireland or it had to be between Northern Ireland and the mainland uh, UK. Um, so that is what Boris Johnson and the Brexiteers have delivered. Uh, and now they don't want to live with it. Um, they have a defence of sorts, which is to say goods coming from the mainland to Northern Ireland that are not going to go any further into the European Union uh, shouldn't be checked. But how you dis differentiate between those is, is anybody's guess. But I think more worryingly is the fact that, you know, they agreed this protocol. It was part of a treaty. They're now prepared to override it with domestic... Uh, legislation, which is very damaging for our reputation. So we'll see uh, whether they can wiggle out of it. It's interesting how Liz Truss, when I mean, this is Westminster Village stuff, I guess, but how Liz Truss will emerge from this, because the other thing that slightly worries me is a very, very, very serious issue has become a sort of internal Tory political football about who can be toughest frankly, on the mm. Europeans, which is a really easy, lazy Tory trope. And, and if you were going to do that, why would you do that at a time when actually Europe has yes. come together over the war in Ukraine? It's, it's, And then Boris Johnson writes this article in the Belfast Telegraph today, which is actually quite conciliatory. It goes against what Liz Truss mm. has been saying, saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't want a trade war with Europe. And it, it's, it's a lack of joined up government, isn't it? Well, they actually don't know what they're doing. Do they? I mean, they don't have an answer. Generally or just on this? On this on, well, <laughs> on these particular issues, <laughs> they frankly wish it would go away mm. because they're not prepared to grip it because they know they, it's their fault. Do, do you think it just came about because they were so desperate to get Brexit oh, done totally, in inverted totally, commas, totally. commas? They said, OK, we'll do this and we'll come back to it later. <laughs> totally. We've all done that, Ian. I mean, let's not blame them too much. We've all done that. Have we? <laughs> We've all I'm trying to think of an occasion. But tried to get ourselves out of a hole, yeah. buried our heads in the sand and yeah. hoped the problem would go away. Unfortunately, you're the British government. It doesn't yeah. work like that. Yeah. I feel. Um, yeah, I think you, you're, you're correct, actually, that they were just so desperate to get Brexit done that it was just kind of like, yeah, we'll do whatever, Northern Ireland Protocol, fine. It was almost like it was an afterthought. But now the afterthought is here. Here, you know, this is the time where we need to figure it out. I do also think that <clears throat> definitely the DUP are bulking at the fact that there could be a Sinn Féin first minister or a deputy first minister. You know, they essentially have the same job, but one has to be the deputy. But I think the reality of that for the DUP is scary for them because it could take 
Northern Ireland, an island down the road of unification, which is, you know, exactly what they don't want. Um, in terms of have the DUP and Boris Johnson lost the plot over Northern Ireland, um, may, maybe not so much the DUP, but I don't know if Boris Johnson ever had the plot. I don't know if he ever really knew what he was doing because like we said it feels like the northern Ireland protocol was a complete afterthought to get brexit done and now is the time where he has to face up to the fact that he doesn't really have a clue what he's doing mm. well mo and andy have got another three minutes to think about their answers because oh, we're going <laughs> to get the news headlines first you're listening to cross question on lbc i'm ian dale it's half past eight and andy ivy has the news headlines the Prime Minister says he's had robust discussions with political parties in Northern Ireland over the protocol and power sharing. Mr Johnson says legislation to rip up parts of the rules on trade with the rest of the UK is insurance in case a deal can't be reached with the EU. The Governor of the Bank of England has warned about what is called ap apocalyptic food prices rises. Andrew Bailey has told MPs there's a very real income shock coming as a result. Boris Johnson has praised the bravery of a 17-year-old Blackpool footballer who's become the first current professional player in the UK to come out as gay. Jack Daniels says he's received amazing support from teammates and his family. LBC weather, clear spells for many areas overnight. Tomorrow, dry and very warm in sunny spells for central and eastern parts. Some rain in the west, a high of 24 degrees. This is LBC. Julie. Leading Britain's conversation. Cross question with Ian Dale. Tweet at LBC. 8.33 on LBC. Afia Hagen, Andy MacDonald, Ed Vasey and Mo Hussein with me taking your calls. 0345 973 Now, we were in the middle of a question from Sean in concert, which was, it's gone off my screen now, so I'm trying to remember it. It's something about Boris Johnson and the DUP effectively losing the plot in Northern Ireland. Yes, it's come back on my screen and I was right. Um, Mo Hussein. Well, I think the tables have turned following the election, so the DUP are striking whilst they feel they still have an element of power and say in things. Um, but by doing so, they're holding the entire democratic process to ransom. I think it's interesting that the rhetoric from Number 10 and the UK government has really dialed down over the last few uh, last few days or so, where there was a lot of talk of ripping things up uh, to actually trying to find a way through, uh, and this being an insurance policy. And there's a big difference difference between announcing that you're going to do legislation and then actually doing it. It will really take a lot of time for any legislation to get through if it does get through the House of Commons and House of Lords on um, overriding the Northern Ireland Protocol. Hopefully in the meantime 
there can be uh, cooler heads prevailing and a pragmatic solution reached because a review mechanism is baked in to the protocol. There's often a disconnect between an intention in government and delivery on the ground. Uh, but I don't think uh, we need to go for the nuclear option. And I think the DUP, as we've discussed, have also got sour grapes because they have lost mm. the majority uh, in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Andy McDonald, I wonder whether there is a chink of light here because all of the parties in the Northern Ireland elections said in their manifestos that there were things regarding the protocol that they would like to change. Mm. So you're, you're not, it's not sort of Sinn Féin and the SDLP saying everything about the protocol is good. And the unionists, they know that a lot of Northern Ireland business actually support the principle of the protocol and have no problem with it whatsoever. But there are clearly things that need to change. Sure. And that, it seems as though that there's, there's a roadblock here where the European Commission are saying, well, you signed up to it, we're not willing to change it, or beyond beyond bits of... Well, there is an tinkering. element of that, you know, I mean, you know, if you negotiate it, you, you sign it, you ratify it, and then when it, it doesn't suit you, you then try to step away from it. The, I mean, this is typical of Northern Ireland politics, let's remember that, the DUP saying no, never, no surrender, and, you know, we're not playing ball. That's, um, and I think other colleagues have made the point about them having their nose pushed out of joint and being in second second place but Boris Johnson actually made that promise there'll be no border there'll be no, no forms to fill in put them in the bin that's you don't have to I and mean, that was just a ridiculous thing to say and it was this obsession with get Brexit done and what he's ended up with get Brexit wrong um, and you know in Brussels I was there a few months ago and there's great sadness that we've left uh, but great affection for us at the same time but the, the bottom line is they're going to protect their single market and their customs union that is just be, there's that's not up for debate that has to be protected and so we've got to understand that and we baked that in to the agreement to accommodate that d desire that said in your right i think there is a chink of like when i was speaking to make uk um the 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 the, uh, the, the uh, business representatives over there uh and and europeans as well there's this desire, there's a willingness and appetite to actually get to a technological solution which would resolve GBNI, which we were always promised, weren't we? There was always some WYSIWYG mm. way of tracking the goods. We've got barcodes, you can track your Amazon package and all the rest of it. That can be done. And, of course, the big prize is if we can get it resolved for GBNI, we can resolve this EU-UK and have much less friction at our internal uh, borders and our external borders to the European Union. But the very thought of at a time of crisis like this, we've got a war going on, we've got a cost of living crisis, and we're going to provoke a response from the European Union. That's madness. We know they want to protect that single market. Really, we should be in the spirit of cooperation. But this posturing by Johnson, uh, I'm afraid, for well, every action... by trust rather than Johnson. Well, the moment, well, isn't it? well, true, but he's there today um, with, with, with the usual. But for every action there will be a reaction and you know and the european union are keen to you hear from our the irish friends how they're trying to uh, persuade people to be more pragmatic about how they and yes change by all means but not this gun to the head business mm. okay um right sean thank you very much indeed for that question um ollie in newmarket is our next caller hello ollie oh hi Ian. how you doing and hi penny all right, thank um, you. Um, it's, a, it's a quick question, really, quite a yes or no kind of one. Um, do you think it's time, with a view of what's happening in Northern Ireland and obviously other things that are happening, um, it, do you think it's time for a, another referendum on, on the situation? <laughs> what, on Europe? On Europe, what, yeah. No, on, on the... well, what, would, what would the question be? What kind of referendum do you want? Well, is it time to have? You could well, you could do it two ways. You could have a referendum about do we have enough of a referendum about Europe, or you could just go straight for is it time? A lot of things change oh. since it's happened, and it's obviously not working. We've got a government that can't sort of, you know, obviously get this situation in Ireland sorted out. We've got a war going on, and um, we've seen the unity in things like the Eurovision Song Contest. I know that's obviously different, but obviously I think it's time because you know, obviously it's not going not going to plan. Okay, Afia, is a referendum the way to sort out this issue? No, 
absolutely not. It, um, I don't think we should have a referendum about a referendum. Um, and I don't think we should have a referendum. Maybe we should have a referendum about, about a referendum, referendum about, about a referendum. referendum. You were going to say that it's, as well. <laughs> you and like I have you... always thought very much alike, Ed. <laughs> it's like when you have a meeting about a meeting or when the meeting could have been an email. Listen, now, now is not the time for a right. referendum. Let's keep this one short, Ed. Uh, no. But, I mean, having said that, it, the Brexiteers banged on about this issue for 30 years and ended up getting their way. So if you're a Remainer, start banging on and keep banging on for the next 30 years. No. Absolutely not. I think we have had our fill of referendums, but there is a serious point here, which is uh, the Prime Minister and his supporters talk a lot about getting the big cause right, getting Brexit done. If this is going to unravel over the coming days and weeks, I think this does become an issue that people will look to vote on again at the next election and question the promises that were made to them. Andy? No to a referendum. We had so much division. Uh, we haven't healed yet, um, so I wouldn't uh, want to see us do that. But we do we do have the principle established in this country about referendums for a referendum because we have trade unions subjected to having a ballot to see if they're going to have a ballot. Um, so it oh, that's does exist. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Ollie, I'm afraid you have convinced absolutely no one. Thank you very much for your call, though. Let's go to a text question from Jonathan in Cleethorpes, who says, It's a brave and wonderful thing that Jake Daniels has come out as gay, but he's the only openly gay footballer in the UK. Why? Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this story, Jake Daniels is a 17-year-old player with Blackpool. Blackpool's come up a lot today, hasn't it? Um, and he's come out to his teammates and he's now given an interview to Sky Sports all about it. And um, it is quite remarkable that this is the first time <laughs> since Justin Fashionu that this has happened. Um, Mo, would you like to kick us off? Yeah, I, mean, I think it's extremely brave and I think good on him um, for taking this step. Uh, I imagine it was very, very difficult and there are probably lots of reasons why more people don't do it, whether it is... Uh, fear of what people will say about them, career prospects, will they be damaged, um, public opinion, bullying, you know, the list could go on and on. It's still slightly startling that in 2022 we are having these kind of conversations, but then it always takes one person to do something and once that person does it, it does become easier for other people to, you know, see the results, see the outcome, see the goodwill he's had and follow suit. Andy? I think it's, it's superb that he's done this and he's got all the support of his teammates and his community. Uh, but Mo's right, it's, it's, this is going to be such an important moment and he'll be long remembered after his playing days are gone for having made this step because others will follow. But let's not underestimate the abuse that people might, might receive. And we've seen it uh, uh, with black players getting such terrible abuse within the confines of football so we've got to be make sure that our institutions in football are ready to respond and take the appropriate action if people are offensive about people being open about the decisions that they've made but absolutely good on him for doing this and uh, i think we all admire him there were rumours, I think, a year or two ago that a leading Premier League footballer was going to come out and in the end he decided not to. And I suspect he was persuaded not to by his agent who will have worried about financial deals falling. I actually think if a Premier League footballer did this, they would become very hot property yeah. overnight commercially. What, why do you think that it, football has been behind other sports? Although in women's football, it's not an issue. There are lots of openly lesbian footballers, aren't there? Well... I mean, we started this programme by saying it's very important that politicians don't lecture people about how they live their lives. But it is extraordinary that in football in 2022, which has become a very sophisticated kind of spectator sport, if you like, uh, compared to what it was like, you know, 40 years ago with the terraces and so on, that there is still terrible racism uh, from the stands. And frankly, the reason footballers haven't come out is because there's terrible... Uh, homophobia and homosexual abuse uh, and you can be sure as eggs is eggs uh, that this poor guy is going to get that at the next game. Now some of it I'm not excusing it, I don't want to go get this all wrong because we talked about it but you know, some of it might be to unnerve your the team you don't want to win by being very nasty to them but quite a lot of it is genuine and really really unpleasant and uh, you know, I support footballers campaign against this. And one of the things that really annoyed me today, by the way, just as a r random aside, was the Prime Minister and other politicians saying, how dare you boo Prince William and the National Anthem, when only three months ago they were saying, by all means, boo 
footballers who take the knee. Mm. I so admired the footballers who were prepared to make that stand, and I really hope that footballers stand as one with this young man and face down the abuse I'm afraid that is inevitable he will get. Yeah. I feel. I mean, I think it's shocking that in 2022 we only have one openly gay footballer and I'm sure that there is, I'm 99% I'm sure that there's more who wish they could do the same thing and I really, really hope that they do and I understand why people don't live in their truth and walk in their truth because the abuse that footballers get from the stands, even this weekend we had um, players suffering racial abuse in the stands, you know, the abuse that they get from the stands from the so-called fans, from other players, if they play in other countries, sometimes if they play here, mm -hmm. is absolutely shocking. So I get it why I wouldn't walk in my truth. Because I don't want to get all that abuse. You know, I, I like a quiet life. I want to play and go home. And so I think it's amazing of him to be the first. And what that must feel like must be incredible. And it must be a lot of pressure, actually, to be the first. Um, I hope he's surrounded by a great team that will support him and manage him in the right way, that won't put him under too much pressure to be, you know, the poster boy mm. for gay footballers, because that will be tough. In the, on the other hand, though, I really hope that this leads the way for other footballers who are gay to walk in their truth. Well, he's made it easier, hasn't he? I, I remember when um, when I was selected as a parliamentary candidate and I was the first one to be selected, having told the selection committee that I was gay. I mean, there were other gay MPs, but they hadn't come out to their constituencies. And I can remember at a Conservative Party conference, this young guy came up to me and he said, thank you. And I said, I didn't know him. I said, what are you thanking me for? And he said, because you've made it easier for the rest of us. Mm. And that guy was your researcher. Absolutely. <laughs> are you going to cry? Right? It was. How, how lovely. Yeah. I, remember, funny enough, I remember my researcher telling me he was gay and it was like he regarded it as a massive deal. And I looked at him and said, <laughs> it's not a big yeah. deal. But it's very interesting, obviously. But Ian, as a... You are a proper football fan. I'm sure the other people on this panel are, but I happen to know that you are a passionate... West Ham fan, you're on the stands uh, or in the in the seats as it were in the stands every Saturday. The Ian Dale we know and love tonight is not there in the stands. The W word may come out, the F word may come out. What do you think? Because you you're surrounded by. Well, I mean, I'll give you an example. Um, a few years ago, when we were still at Upton Park, Brighton came to play. Well, of course, Brighton is seen <laughs> as a city where there are lots of gay people live, and this chant started in the stands aimed at the Brighton players, does your boyfriend know you're here? Now, I, I, thought, no, no, no. I thought that was genuinely hilarious as a gay person. I found that funny. I didn't find it offensive in the least. But you couldn't do that now. If people chanted that now, they would be thrown out. Oh, interesting. Mm. So, I mean, ev everyone has a different line to draw over what is abuse and what isn't abuse. I, I mean, I just thought that was good East End humour. But yeah. o other people will have taken a different view. Thanks for that question, Ed. You're welcome. Really appreciate it. Uh, I've got another couple of questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, leave Not your choice, we'll, Ed. we'll leave them for goodness. a few minutes. It's 847. <laughs> LBC. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. Conservative MP and safeguarding Minister Rachel McLean. Police will be permitted to stop and search people without suspicion of a crime. What happens if the police then apply to then seek an extension for a superintendent? So there is another time period, which I'm sure you've got in front of me. Well, you're uh, the minister who's been briefed for this. From what hours does it go? So the point is that these are put in place... Yes, what are the hours that a superintendent now can licence? I'm being quite upfront with you. I haven't got the paper in front of me. Do you Forgive not think me. you should know, Minister? I do know, but the oh, fact Oh, well, if you do I've know, had... do share. Look, you're doing a very good job of demonstrating that I haven't got the papers in front of me now. Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Back tomorrow morning from 7. Listen on your radio and on Global Player, LBC.
Trust Question with Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. It's 10 to 9. Afi Hagen, Andy McDonald, Ed Vasey and Mo Hussein are with us taking your calls. Let's go to Kieran in Durham. Hello, Kieran. Hi there. Martin Lewis has warned of civil unrest if the cost of living crisis is not properly addressed. Do the panel share those fears? Afi. Yeah, I mean, I, um, yeah, I could understand why Martin Lewis would say that. I think they will get to a point where people will say enough is enough. You know, we aren't being properly supported. The cost of living crisis is out of control. You know, unless we really stand up and, and make a point, how are the government going to do anything? But what would the point be? Because we all know that a lot of the inflation, I'm not saying all of it, but a lot of it is worldwide inflation. Our inflation rate actually isn't as high as some European countries. Oh, it's about halfway down the league table. Absolutely. So, so, given that our government doesn't have it within its control mm -hmm. to do a lot to affect, you can say they could make changes to um, uh, energy re regulation, I suppose, but for foodstuffs, they can't do anything. Yes, that's true. You know, the cost of living crisis is affecting everybody, the global south, the global north, absolutely everywhere. Every, every country probably is touched by it. So th I agree with you on that one. I think there is things that the government could have done, could continue to do, you know, windfall taxes and things like that. I know they're not, you know, it's, it's just, it's easy for me to say windfall tax. And I know, you know, that it may not be that easy in real life. It's easier in, than apocalyptic, isn't it? Yes, yeah. it is easier than that, Ed. Um, but <laughs> I think there will be a point where people will say enough is enough. And I feel like there is, you know, a hint of something bubbling under the surface, so to speak. You know, and I think people will stand up and want to be counted. So civil unrest, yeah, it could happen. I mean, we look at what's happened in Sri Lanka. You know, it's a different situation there, um, in a much worse situation than we are. They've only got fuel for one more day, I read somewhere. You know, they're only a, a six weeks away from running out of um, food, they've completely out of their foreign currency reserves. It's a different situation, but they have had civil unrest. It could happen anywhere. Andy? Uh, I don't think we're on the verge of civil unrest. I think there's civil disquiet. We are a, a conservative country with a small C. I think people are very patient, uh, but mm. at the same time uh, simmering with anger. Um, we will have a test because we will have a major march in London at the end of June, which has been uh, well promoted, and that will build. The the the, the test for me will Is be how that... on the 18th. It, uh, the yeah, various union so. leaders keep trying to persuade me to go on. Yeah, you you you, you, sh you should you should. Well, go. I keep telling them I've got a party at David Beckham's house. Oh, right. What's the theme of the <laughs> march? Uh, it's about the cost of living crisis uh, uh, principally. So, so there's an expression, but the test will be how that how the police then respond to that, given the direction of travel from. Uh, from the, from the, from Parliament, that you know we should clamp down on on protests. I think that would be a. Uh, a this has been planned for ages, hasn't it? I mean, it they, has, they, yeah. they can't really restrict that. You wouldn't have thought. Well, they can't they can't restrict it at all. I mean, you're going to tell somebody, will you stop being so noisy when you're walking down Whitehall with uh, you and your ten thousand people, whatever it is? No, it's the people who clean themselves the road, though. They've got to be stopped. Mm. Yeah, the, I mean, those really suffragettes were a real nuisance, weren't they? No, I mean, come on, the somebody. Somebody, somebody, somebody yeah, cleaning themselves, the, what were they somebody cleaning of themselves to the road because you haven't insulated your roof. I mean, yeah, do yeah. me a favour, yeah. uh, please. Yeah. It is annoying, but they it's, are it's taking a the shame mic. that they have to do it. And the bloke on the corner, and he's a Remainer with the megaphone, who spends all day shouting Don't about Forrest. <laughs> Come on. Don't get me started Still, on yeah, that. Exactly, Good thank guy. you. I've united the panel. Yeah. Now, no. where were we? What are you doing with David Beckham on the 18th? <laughs> he's not going to be there, apparently. <laughs> He heard you were coming. <laughs> no. I don't think we're near civil unrest, and I think uh, I don't see how that would help the situation either. But I do think that the government can't just say we'll come back to you in October with uh, further help, further measures. I think they need to read the room, read the country, and there are certainly moves afoot for announcements and help to be provided way be before October, because this is an increasing problem increasing issue and the other challenge is because the government has stepped in so much uh, into the economy and the country during the pandemic there is a precedent here and that was clearly a very different time and a lot of money was spent and I don't think the government wants to go back to that place but they have done it before um, so I do think more action will need to be forthcoming quite soon.
Kieran, thank you for that. We can fit in um, one final question, if you're all relatively brief. Uh, Keith is in Upminster. Hello, Keith. Ian, I know you said don't mention the Eurovision Song Contest, but has <laughs> is Vladimir Putin about to meet his Waterloo? Oh, very good. <laughs> Reference to Sweden winning in 1974 and joining NATO. That is a you, good That question. is a good question, that isn't is it? So you can, can you answer say, it first. Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, who knows? I mean, it's a terrifying situation, but I think what we learned from appeasing Putin over at Ukraine is appeasement doesn't work. Mm. Sorry to use that word, but therefore we shouldn't be saying, oh, it's wrong for Sweden to join NATO or Finland to join NATO. Uh, we should support that. But who knows how the Russians will react? But I don't think they're in a, much of a position to do a great deal. The thing is, Putin is effectively NATO's greatest recruiting sergeant, isn't mm -hmm. he? At this oh, point. Right. Yeah, he is at this point. I mean, I'd rather be on NATO's side <laughs> than his side, and I think most countries would. Um, I think he's going to have to accept that Sweden and Finland want to join NATO, will join NATO, then there really isn't anything that he can do about that. You know, we don't want to antagonise him. We say that all the time. Um, but if the countries want to join NATO, then they should. And I think they probably will. I, I got one of these internet memes earlier pretending to be a NATO award. And it's got the NATO logo at the top. And it says, the Secretary General proudly presents this award to Vladimir Putin for the outstanding achievement as the 2022 <laughs> NATO Salesman of the Year. <laughs> My... Well, everything that he wanted to achieve, the opposite has happened. So there is now European unity, uh, international consensus, and NATO is expanding. I think uh, if uh, Finland and Sweden do join, the NATO borders with Russia will double. So uh, he's the one who has massively lost out and his plan has backfired. So let's see. I mean, I think he's shown the extent of his military might so far in Ukraine. I'm not sure that can be replicated in other countries. There's always the possibility of cyber attacks and things like that. But uh, I think whatever he wanted to achieve, the opposite has actually now happened. Andy? I don't think Finland and Sweden would have progressed their discussions with uh, NATO were they not confident of that that would be uh, a secure thing for them to do. I think hitherto they've always been terrified of the consequences of taking that action. Uh, Russia is weakened, but we know what we're I don't think they've front. even thought about taking that action before, have they? I don't mm. think it's been a running debate in Well, country. I mean, in, in, in Finland, I think they've constantly lived with, a, with the threat of, of mm. neighbouring Russia, and, 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 and they have experience uh, from previous conflicts. Uh, so, so they are uh, rightly nervous, and uh, we know what we say about wounded bear. Um, so uh, I think that the timing of this is, is, is quite choice. Uh, but of course, we've seen the erosion of some of the capability of Russia. As I say, I'm not underestimating it for one single moment, but Ukraine is making uh, progress around Kharkiv. Um, whether they can make progress into the south and the southeast around Mariupol and, the, and Severodonetsk and the rest of it, that's another matter. But undoubtedly, um, the, the the, the, the balance has shifted and that's left the opportunity for Sweden uh, 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 and Finland to, to progress the discussions. So he's, he, and Mo's absolutely right. Wherever his calculation was, it's gone wrong mm. because he's got the exact opposite uh, outcome that he was looking for. Keith, thank you. Uh, let's go to a final text question from Gina in Hartlepool. McDonald's has said it will permanently leave Russia after more than 30 years and has started to sell its restaurants. What restaurant chain do you wish would leave the UK? Well, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Um, Ed? Angus Steakhouse. Really? What have you got against them? I don't know, but I had to come up with something, and I just think the design is so depressing. When you walk past them, it makes you think you're still living in the 1970s. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with the 19... Well, actually, there was, wasn't there? But, uh, Afia? I'd have to say McDonald's. I'd want McDonald's to leave. Oh, why? Yeah. I, it always makes me ill when I eat it. The hash browns, I love them. No, it could never be me. OK. Mo? There was one, I think it might have been Five Guys, that I went to where you could have a no. hundred different kinds of soft drink. And at the beginning, I thought that was pretty cool. And then I felt quite sick, having tried several yeah, I mean, so yeah. You had a hundred soft drinks? At your you could have a hundred different combinations oh, of really random flavours. <laughs> After a while, it got a bit too much. too much. I cannot hear a word against Five complaint. Guys. They do the best burgers and the best chips. And always order small chips, because it's a massive yeah, portion. Yeah, yeah. I think, Andy? Well, I'm, I'm struggling, because... I've never been to TGI Friday, so if they went, I wouldn't miss them. No, I like them. Um, okay, that's fine. I, li I like Five Guys too, but I want Bistro Pierre to come back to my town because I enjoyed that. It was a good Bistro Pierre. There was a little no. chain of them. It wasn't no, that many. Never heard really of nice, really nice, really nice, but it's no longer there. So I want them to come back 
not go away. Okay. I would say any chain that sells Japanese food, personally. Really? Really? Yeah. Oh, well, that started oh, a disgusting. whole new debate. That's, that's We've only got 30 disgusting. seconds left. Oh, Actually, we haven't even got that. We're 56 <laughs> seconds over our time. Ed Daisy, <laughs> Afia Hagen, Mo Hussein and Annie McDonald. thank you very much indeed. We have another cross-question for you tomorrow night at the same time. Coming up in a moment, though, we're going to talk about Pretty Patel's latest wheeze to permanently lift restrictions on stop-and-search powers. Um, I'm sure you'll have a view on that. One minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and... Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation. This is LBC. From Global's newsroom. The Prime Minister has been accused of taking sides during a visit to Belfast to encourage the resumption of power sharing at Stormont. Sinn Féin says Boris Johnson is trying to percolate the DUP, which has blocked the formation of an executive demanding changes to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Mr Johnson described his talks as robust. I said to, uh, to the DUP, um, we want to see you back in the executive.